Sounds good. We can talk a little bit to get started. Go for it. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Brock Johnson with the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Wahoo, actually. So I was in Lincoln. I'm the urban conservationist for NRCS, if you don't know me. Um, Tammy's going to be recording the meeting today, so I was going to throw that out there. If you got questions, use the chat or just chime in if you want to, if something if you want to bring some up, something up or participate in some kind of way. And then uh, I guess for you guys in here, I got sign up sign that or sign in sheet but we're going to pull that out there's three four of us here in the office at NDE today and again did you want everybody to go around and introduce themselves and maybe for the small group it'd be nice if everyone just wants to say your name and whatever you're affiliated with um that would that would be great that's so. awesome okay so i'm done megan do you want to start in here Hi, I'm, I'm Megan McGuffey. I'm with the Community Crops Program of Family Service Lincoln. So kind of in the nonprofit sector, focusing on urban um, gardens and farms. And I'm Tim Renna, and Megan and I are the co-chairs of the Lincoln Mayor's Community Committee on Local Food, which will be releasing its food plan that we've been working on for the past year and a half, probably on the 17th of July. And I'm Sarah Smith, the Nebraska Department of Education in the Office of Coordinated Student Support Services, and I coordinate farm to school statewide. Great. Uh, Stacy, are you on with us, Stacy Turnbull? I am. Morning or afternoon, wherever we are. Uh, Stacy Turnbull, I'm also like Sarah with the Department of Education, uh, working with secondary uh, teachers and students in ag education. Awesome. And Marla Marks, are you with us today? I am Marla Marks. I work for USDA Rural Development and I am out in the Scotts Bluff office and we work with the value added producer grant and also with some of the rural business development grants are another way we utilize um, do some things with um, local foods. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. Rip, is it? Are you with us today? Yep. Greg Fripp, founder and CEO of Whispering Roots, 501c3 nonprofit based out of Omaha, Grow, Feed, and Educate. We work in both urban and rural areas, focusing on urban ag, next generation agriculture, hands-on experiential learning in STEM, and then also with emergency food distribution. We are now one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, last mile heavy lift emergency food distributions in the Omaha metro area. Great. Great having you with us today, Greg. Um, Lasonia, are you with us today? Oh. Oh. I'm Lasagna oh, and I'm pretty much just a homestead farmer um, that is very interested in environmental um, injustice and um, just uh, food in general and that's pretty much it. Awesome, thank you. And last one online is Jacob. Fritton, Jacob, are you with us today? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jacob Fritton, I am the uh, Director of Agriculture for the Nebraska Chapter of the Nature Conservancy uh, um, office out of Gothenburg, which is also where I'm currently at. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Megan, with your agenda, I think you want some like agency updates. I kind of just gave a broad overview. Is that the first? Sure. Thing you want, should we introduce there's the last a, few? Oh, there's sorry. a few more of us online. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> not in How dare you, How dare here. you, Brock? <laughs> <laughs> they, I saved the best for last. Couple. Sorry, you want to show up on the right side of my queue. So, John Porter, take it away. Uh, I'm John Porter with Nebraska Extension. I'm the urban agriculture educator in the Omaha metro area. Also the statewide program leader for our horticulture, landscape and environmental systems team across the state. Uh, and uh, one of the things I do as educator is I am the, the co-chair of our local food and healthy farms conference that we co-host with Nebraska Sustainable Ag Society. Awesome, and Terry James, I was skipped right over you too, didn't I? Yeah, you did, but that's okay. Best for last again, I say. Sure. So I'm Terry James. I'm with Nebraska Extension um, with the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture. 
Um, I am the consumer horticulture side of um, local foods. Um, I am the statewide uh, master gardener coordinator. Um, and then I also am a content manager for Backyard Farmer. Well, I see Sam Wortman's on too. Sam, are you with us? Yes. Hi, Brock. Uh, I'm Sam Wortman. Uh, I'm in agronomy and horticulture doing uh, research and teaching on small scale fruit and vegetable production. Awesome. I think that's everybody. Who did I skip over now? Did Tammy introduce herself? Who? Tammy. I know we were oh, yeah, Tammy. I don't need to do that. <laughs> yeah, you do. No. Um, I am Tammy Nordman. I am the administrative assistant for our wetland staff, our soil staff, and our program staff here at NRCS. Awesome. Tammy keeps me straight. She's been going here. So thanks, Tammy, for all you do. Okay, so yeah, so Stacy, we did Stacy was yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think yeah, moving into kind of programming and operations share from NRCS, I think will be very nice. Yeah, I think I'm Megan. You mentioned maybe the update from Sam Wartman on the urban soil health. You, since he's on, should we just do that first? Or sure, sure. And kind of unscripted, but could you help us with their like give us an update on their urban soil health project? Sure, yeah, happy to do that. Um, yeah, we have uh, currently, I think it's probably about 350 actively engaged participants. We had about 500 applicants, um, and then kind of with each stage of the, the project, you know, we lose uh, a little bit of engagement because we're asking people to do things, right? So um, about 500 people signed up, and then we asked them to pull a soil sample from their garden or small farm. And uh, they sent that to us. We just got the results back uh, for the soil health assessment from Ward Labs and Kearney. And uh, so we're starting to dig into that a little bit. Um, pretty interesting to, to just look and at the benchmark for uh, what these soils look like that people are growing food in uh, around the state in terms of just organic matter texture, pH, microbial activity, um, aggregate stability, all those types of things. Uh, we're doing some analyses on campus too for changes in organic matter over time um, in response to some of the soil health management practices. So those participants are uh, either deploying uh, a cover crop. So we've been getting pictures of people growing buckwheat and cowpea and, and oats in their in their gardens. Uh, uh, a good number of people applied compost or biochar, and then some people are using no-till practices or some combination of those four. Um, so we had a, a kind of a kickoff webinar where I kind of walked through best management practices for using those different things and how we're going to collect data throughout the project. Um, and so we've just been trying to engage with those participants every one to two weeks through uh, an email distribution. Um, and uh, we did grow, uh, provide some seeds for people to grow a common zucchini crop. Um, not sure yet. <laughs> what we're going to be able to do with that data um, because, you know, people are planting it at different times and in different ways. But the goal there was, you know, to try to gather a little bit of biological data beyond what's happening in the soil. Um, so it'll be interesting to see um, what those different yields look like across the state, driven by not only the different soil health management practices that they're using, but also just um, their existing kind of soil profile. Uh, and then we also have pictures of everybody's garden or farm. Uh, so we're looking at things like, you know, access to full sunlight versus partial um, and surrounding structures. It's also been fun to look at those pictures to see what types of practices people are using uh, in terms of trellis systems and mulches and irrigation um, and pest management. So um, we've, we're, at this point, kind of in the data accumulation phase, and we've got a lot of it, so going to be recruiting students to to dive into that. Yeah, yeah, we just, I think Aaron had mentioned it last time. I'm just excited to hear more about it as it's developing. So thanks for sharing. Anything else you want to share? I know, I think since we're a small group today, kind of, if anyone has announcements or things, we'll make sure there's time throughout the meeting for that. But since you're already in the spotlight, Sam, if there's anything you want to share. <laughs> That was uh that's probably our our biggest uh 
thing to share. Um, we're we've got a number of other projects ongoing um, related to um, biodegradable mulch um, management for strawberries, uh, carrots, and leafy greens. Um, but um, but yeah, those the most immediate uh, thing is probably the the urban soil health initiative. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. So when we look back on 2023 and we see that there's like a market crash in the zucchini market, <laughs> the end caused that by having people grow thousands of zucchinis across the state. Hey Brock, yeah. this is Tammy. Yeah. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. There was somebody via phone and now they're gone. I think. Yeah, I saw the number pop up and now I see they're gone. Yeah, okay. I was going to try to grab them before they popped off, but. If they come back on, I'll try and grab their number, Tammy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, John. What were you saying? Oh, yeah, the, the size. So is this a special uh, variety of zucchini or just a random common one? Or how why, how'd you go about picking that one? Yeah, I mean, it's a specific variety. I don't know that it's special. We were looking for something that's uh, more of a bush type and less vining uh, because our project area, we asked everybody to set aside a 10 by 10 or just a total of 100 square feet. So we didn't want their that entire area to necessarily be taken over by zucchini. So uh, it was at least advertised as more of a bush type, shorter season. Um, so yeah, it's the, the variety is Dunja. We got it from Johnny's. It's carried by high mowing organics as well. Yeah, we've got a mix, a mixed bag of participants too. Some that are adhering pretty closely to certified organic practices. So, uh, so that's kind of the the lowest common denominator that we use for uh, deploying things like seed. Is that we try to make sure that it's all certified organic. Did the same thing with the cover crop seed, so that we're not uh, excluding anybody on that basis. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Will the agency updates? Yeah, I think that's going to agency updates. Yeah. OK, uh, Megan, wanted me to kind of give an agency update um, as far as some of the things that I've been working on um, program wise, the things that are going on and, and that. So I I apologize, but um, every, a lot of our rest of our state office staff is out today, so um, I'm going to either I'm just going to get my way through this as best I can. But uh, um, last time I was with you, I was the outreach coordinator. That was the position that our chief of NRCS, Terry Cosby, um, authorized. I was in that position for 13 months, and then I applied for the urban conservationist, which is the new position on uh, Neil Dominey staff, the partnerships um, area at NRCS. And I was lucky enough to get that job. So I've been in this position now since April. Uh, this year, and you know, I've been doing some of this work already with um, just the outreach component, but now I'm focused more on urban. So it's been really great to see the projects that are going on. Um, I just tell you that I, I mean, I get about 30 to 40 emails a day from across the state from different people interested in urban ag. So there's a lot of discussion happening and all this really cool stuff. But uh, as far as what I'm working on most recently, so and this is new for me. I mean, I'm a 25 year employee, but I didn't know how some of our own internal functions worked. Um, but basically, we talked about this urban practice list that we had last time. And our program that we use utilize the most is Environmental Quality Incentive. EQIP is the acronym we use for that. That sign up cutoff, you can sign up continually for that program year round. Um, and in November of every year, we've been having a ranking cutoff. And so we take all the applications we have in November and rank them. And then we have urban practices, about 40 practices that we introduced last year at the first uh, urban subcommittee meeting. And so the practice to circle back how this works is um, in May and April, or April and May uh, till about the 1st of June, we met internally with our staff and we took recommendations that this committee gave um, as far as our practices, you know, which ones we were using more. And I don't have a breakdown of that exactly. I kind of know which ones are being applied for. And then we tried to, um, it's our opportunity to change the component of a practice. And I'll give you a real quick example of 
how that works and what we're doing to make it better fit Nebraska small farmers and urban farmers. Um, and then we can add a practice too. And that I think last time we had, we met in March, we talked about a small footprint greenhouse for seed starts. So I worked with our state agronomist, Corey Brubaker on that. And uh, we networked with Kansas and a couple other states, but we have a interim, I'll just tell you now we have an interim, we're, we're shooting for an interim practice. So we submit a practice standard, it becomes the interim practice um, until we can make it an established practice. And so we submitted that a small footprint greenhouse for seed starts as an interim practice next year. And we'll find out here in July. Um, that goes up to our national headquarters and our national agronomists, and they look at it and say if they're going to fund it or, or you know, make it a practice. And so that will be really cool if we can get that. It'll be the first of its kind across the United States that NRCS would fund a greenhouse. We've done the high tunnels and low tunnels, but this would be a practice that we can add. And so uh, the way we wrote the scenario, so we write scenarios for these practices, and it's just kind of a written way of saying what the practice would involve. Um, but basically, we were looking at like a 100 to 200 square foot structure, roughly, that could go on a concrete pad if we wanted to. And we could pay for the, the concrete as a heavy use area protection. That's another practice we could put with that. So you could put it on either a natural base or put it on a concrete pad. Um, and then uh, I think we were looking at like 50 to $80 a square foot as the price we would offer the customer who applied, um, hoping that that'd be an incentive for them to try it. So on 100 square feet, you can do the math. I think that comes out based on some of the um, small footprint greenhouses we saw. We felt that was a pretty good price to get somebody to try that. So um, some of the other practices we worked on, um, the composting facility, we we altered the component for the concrete. The concrete payment was really high. It's that heavy use area protection. So we we tried we we submitted to drop that cost a little bit um, to make it more in line with what's really being experienced out there. And then uh, we modified some irrigation component modifications. So um, and I have a question for this committee uh, too along this line. But basically the surface tape. Uh, we added, I think, a component for surface tape, but the question comes up like in the greenhouse, um, like sprinkler irrigation, we don't have a practice for sprinkler irrigation mm -hmm. in a high tunnel. Is that something, you're, what do you guys feel? Is that some, a practice that would be used if we had it in the high tunnel? Because it seems like most people are using emitters or drip tape or soaker hose in the high tunnel. What's, does anybody have any opinions on that? Or I guess, the reason I'm asking is because now that I'm in this position as urban conservationist, everything you suggest to me, I'm going to write down. And then next time around, I'm going to shoot for every sing last thing, single thing you tell me. Mm -hmm. um, so that we can add it or mo uh, modify a practice and that kind of thing. So does anybody have any opinion on sprinklers in a high tunnel? And this is just to be clear, not greenhouses. Because like the only for crops we use, overhead irrigation only in the greenhouse um but for our for our farmers at least i think they're mostly just using drip tape or soaker hose in high tunnels so yeah yeah i, I mean others might have opinions but i think our recommended best practice is drip irrigation just because of disease pressures you know using those sprinklers and overhead irrigation really you know especially in that confined environment with you know limited ventilation um can really uh, up the disease pressure it'd be something we put in that greenhouse if we can get that approved if it's a greenhouse and it's seed starting absolutely i mean yeah. there are there are definitely lots of ways you can irrigate but are we just use like really simple like overhead sprinkler emitters on a timer and that so that's pretty pretty common i think i don't know for you john you do greenhouse stuff as well so yeah, overhead emitters, or um, if you're talking strictly propagation, often it's like a mist, like it's a emitter, but it's more mist. Um, Terry does a lot of work on greenhouses on campus, and she can share her thoughts as well. Yeah, I was just going to say, I just, um, we're installing um, a bench system um, that has um, heads that I can change out to change the droplet size if I want to, and then it's on a timer. So it will be overhead watering 
um, but it's mounted on the bench. Ooh. So it came, it comes out of DRAM. So this is Greg Fripp. Yeah, I'd say absolutely include that for greenhouses. Absolutely. I'll, I'll let you know how it works once I get it installed. Okay. All right, thank you for that. That's exciting though to know some of the practices are making it in and yeah, good good incentive for all of us to just keep bringing stuff up to you throughout yeah, the year. So, I mean, and I pushed that greenhouse really hard to our staff, and I got some eye rolls, but that just pushed me even harder to go. <laughs> so, um, hopefully, I think I mean I think when I tell groups, I mean I've been out traveling the state and meeting with people, and that is a really big need so i think it's going to be a great thing if we can get that approved and i want to try as many as we can this next sign up so um oh, okay and then we added yeah so i covered the small footprint greenhouse another practice um i guess some feedback on in the field is diversion so we have a diversion practice we normally use with farming uh, where we want to divert water into something or away from something maybe it's a farmstead on an animal feeding operation we build a small diversion to keep the water out of that feed yard area to keep it from being contaminated. So um, we did add a component for diversion and a couple of places I see it working would be uh, we can pay now for the dirt work to move water, convey water around a growing area around a high tunnel or something. So if there's a slope coming into the high tunnel or the grow area, we could pay for some dirt by the cubic foot to move some dirt to divert it around the high tunnel or um, roof and gutter practice. We have some high tunnels and um, we get a big rain event and it's, we're going to convey it to a rain garden or something like that. Now we can use a diversion practice uh, and it's all by the square feet. So I was excited about adding that practice to our practice list. Um, okay, so grant and agreement update on Neil staff. Um, our conservation collaborative agreements uh, application cutoff, I think, was May 8th. And that's the grant agreement where we do local, have a local funding decision. Our state conservationist, Rob Lawson, has the ability to fund those locally. Um, and I don't know the specific numbers, but I can tell you that um, I, I think we more than doubled our applications for that program. And of the, I think we're over 20 applications, and I, I believe around eight or nine half of those applications were for urban and small scale. So that's really exciting. Some of it is technology and research for irrigation practices, um, crop rotations, underserved. I mean, we have a whole um, group of different things that are geared towards urban. And I just think that's great because, uh, like, you know, we've got the Urban Soil Health Initiative. We got a, con a collaborative agreement with Northeast Community College for infiltration pavers and different, um, I think, pollinator seedings and stuff like that. So hopefully we'll expand that um, in our portfolio and be a good thing to help our, our employees speak better about urban ag. So really excited about that. Have you publicly announced the the current awardees yet? We, they have not. Okay. Um, it's it's imminent, I think. Um, <laughs> okay. I know Rob's travel schedule. He's been out of state off and on for the last couple of weeks. But I keep seeing email traffic <laughs> on that. Um, we went through a rank, ranking process. Um, that happened quite a while ago. And I think the funding decision is imminent. So I think you're going to hear a word about it pretty quickly. So um, farm number update. So in my travels, uh, I go, I've been on site a lot of places, uh, especially in Omaha, Lincoln, Eastern Nebraska. But uh, we've had this discussion about acquiring the farm number and how that gets you to participate with FSA, the Farm Service Agency, and then with us for our programs. But we're averaging between 10 and 15 farm number requests per month since March. I think that number is really great because I think that you're going to see, you know, this is a busy time of year. So if you're requesting a farm number now, what what could that be like in the winter or this fall when things slow down? So that's promising because that's that first step to participating with us. And then we're talking with the Farm Service Agency to kind of come up with ways to streamline that and make it easier. You know, uh, we're going through a training process with NRCS and FSA employees to just 
to be able to speak the language of farm numbers to the underserved people who don't know the first thing about us and um, break down some barriers to or some stigmas maybe that would be involved with participation with us. So we're working on that. Um, I see a real good positive outcome out of that, hopefully. And could you say that? I, could you say that again? This is Greg Fripp. I, kind of, I missed a piece of that. Uh, just about getting farm numbers, acquiring the farm number, or yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, um, so we, part of... yeah, in order to participate with the USDA NRCS, um, you have to get a farm number. That's that basically like a social security number for an individual. It's right. a farm number that identifies the land. And so um, we're we're getting between 10 and 15 requests that, that I know of at least per month since March to, to get a farm number from. And these are new farmers um, across the state. So uh, small farmers, urban farmers um, requesting those farm numbers. And we're working with, you know, traditionally uh, we have 71 service centers across Nebraska. And as Sarpy Douglas casts, we have zero. You know, we're we're most populated. And so uh, we're going to the field, taking the forms. I take the forms with me, mm -hmm. uh, explain the FSA forms to the applicant and kind of just give them a background. I don't coach them on how to fill those forms out, but I provide the forms and then give them information about what is asking mm -hmm. and then connect them to the, the service center office where they can um, reach out to the service center, make an appointment with them, and then uh, get the necessary paperwork to get that farm number acquired. Yeah, is that the part where you were saying connecting with like underserved communities, trying to do a better job reaching out? Um, is, that, is that what you were saying there? Yeah, yeah, that's part of it. So as the outreach coordinator, um, yep. I've done my very best to try and do that. And of course, um, if, you have, if you haven't been contacted by me or you know, somebody who would appreciate a visit, you know, send that information to me and I'll make a call and I'll get to that site just as fast as I can. I like the sound of that. I'm wondering, maybe we can set up some time to talk as well, because we're doing a ton of work in the immigrant community that's not only tied to, you know, food distribution, but through our food distribution, we've made huge inroads into some of these communities that otherwise um, don't uh, connect with uh, things like FSA, stuff like that. So yeah, I'd love to set up a, a time to meet and kind of talk about this a little bit further and see how we can collaborate on that and establish maybe heck we could probably even set up some meetings and things with some of our uh, immigrant communities and see if um, we can make help you make some inroads there as well now that would be that would be fantastic um my, my old job as outreach coordinator jamie taney um applied for that job and got it and she started uh, a week ago yesterday so she's worked with uh, beginning farmers and she she knows a, a ton about, um, you know, has firsthand experience about beginning farmers and how that all works. So she definitely could be part of that conversation. But yeah, let's reach out uh, by email at least or just connect to me, Greg, and uh, let's get a time. I come to Omaha lately about three days a week. So yeah, I mean, I meet with different groups and I would I would love to do that. So yeah, I think it'd be great. I'd like it too. Thanks. Okay, awesome. You bet. Thank you. Um, program, uh, just a real quick program update. So that flagship program we use is the EQIP program. Um, I think um, I'm kind of guessing, but I talked to Connor Ward, who's in charge of that program, uh, and just got some rough figures. But again, in fiscal year uh, 22, I think we had 11 applications for the high tunnels, which is what we were calling the fun code for urban and small scale. And we took that to almost 80 in the one year. Um, and then it was about $100,000 of ask, uh, I think in 2000 or 2000, yeah, 2002 fiscal year. We're in 2023 fiscal year now. I think this fiscal year, um, we're, it was well over a million dollars of ask. And I think we funded, I think between five and $600,000 of contracts, something like that. So we're writing the contracts now at NRCS. And then uh, we're working on, we'll be working through the summer and fall on designs. If there's a de something calls for a design like irrigation system or composting facility, whatever it is, we're gonna, we work with the participants um, to get those uh, plans made. And then 
those the contracts are obligated now. Once the contracts get obligated, um, the USDA sets that money aside for that participant at the US Treasury. So when the practices that we design now become installed this fall or winter or whenever that happens, or maybe maybe it's now during the growing season, we reimburse that individual the money the second that practice gets done. Um, the other thing I really like about that EQIP program is that we have the ability to advance half the payment to the individual for the practice. So for example, if you're gonna get a $20,000 high tunnel, we're gonna give you $20,000 um, the NRCS, we can give you half that payment right when you order that thing. And then you get 90 days to install it. Sometimes we can make it go longer if there's a situation where we had a you know, wet period or you had something with your health. I mean, there's reasons why we could extend it. Um, but that gives you 90 days to get that up. And then we pay the second half to you um, right away. I, I think that's huge. We I've used that probably on about 80% of the High tunnel applications I've written um, because it just helps that person get started. Another item so, I'd love to talk to you about when we get together. <laughs> awesome. That's great. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's super easy for our employees to do. Sometimes, uh, like some of our software is not that great <laughs> to make modifications to contracts and stuff, it's uh, kind of laborious. But for the advanced payment, it's really simple. The NRCS employee makes it easy on us. And I've heard from our customers repeatedly how um, that that advanced payment really helped them get started and helped them help get something launched and off the ground. So, but if you think about the gravity of that, you know, it's, it's pretty impactful for sure. So that's a big deal. That is a big deal. Yeah, it's a huge thing. And the other thing is, so these are federal contracts. So once you get the contract you can take that contract into your banker or you know if you've got a lender of some type i don't care if it's a nonprofit lending you money or whatever that contract is as good as gold i mean that helps you secure that loan to get started Wait. so that's that that's that financial sustainability and viability that we're talking about with these systems and all part of the bigger picture of, of making them work so you're absolutely yeah. correct we just did something like that on the food side for small organizations who had pending contracts but didn't have uh, cash flow but being able to do something like that having them be able to go in with you know guaranteed funding uh, up front really could help them secure even if it's some type of gap funding until it's completed that's something that we could wrap you know wrap into some type some type of package i mean we've been busy you know, standing up a new food hub, but now I'm circling back into some of these initiatives that I was looking at before. So this is all in line with some of the projects that we were working on, um, especially before COVID. So, yeah, that's super. The other thing I should mention real fast on the participation with USDA is, you know, once you get that farm number and you got regular participation, um, there there's benefits that you get for being a beginning farmer. So if it's less than 10 years, um, we not only give you your own set of money, your own pool of money to draw from, but they, for the EQIP program, they, we throw like a 25% financial incentive onto the practice to help you get started too. So there's that. And then there's uh, some regular um, cash flow items that happen too. Um, beginning farmers have the opportunity to get reduced premium crop insurance for specialty crops. So that's huge. And then uh, disaster payments. So if there's a drought or something like that, you might be eligible for a payment for losing your crop due to drought or floods or something like that. So, and then the last piece of that for sure is uh, the Farm Service Agency, their loan, the loan programs they have for operating loans and micro purchase loans is really great. The terms are just incredible, actually. So, yeah, if you have more questions on that um, or you know of a good place for us to share that information out, to a group that you're involved with, uh, please just let me or Jamie Taney know and we will coordinate that and make it happen. Will do. Thank you for that. You bet. Um, yeah, so that's really the EQIP update. Um, again, we will have so the fiscal year 2024. Um, our fiscal year starts October 1. The fiscal year 2024 practice list should be out by September. Uh, sometime in September. We like to have that before that fiscal year starts. 
Um, but again, that's something that's public information. We can share that out to this group. Um, and so it's going to be good to see uh, what those payment rates do and, and get a good idea of uh, how the funding could go should you get a contract. So with that, Megan, I did a lot of talking. Um, and again, OK, the last part is just connecting to the underserved. So we're doing a lot of direct marketing uh, to connect to the underserved. And again, uh, Greg's going to be a great connection, it sounds like. So if you see an opportunity for us to at least network and share our information out, uh, or you know somebody that would be good for us to share information on, just by all means, let them know. We'll be glad to make that connection. So with that, Megan? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Does anyone have any additional questions for Brock? Okay. But yeah, summer meeting, things are a little slower. People are out and about. We know that. So um, we did want to keep it short today, but... Uh, I just kind of wanted to wrap up by letting anyone share announcements since we're a little smaller group today. That's a little bit easier to do live. So um, if anyone has any um, updates you want to share with the group, we'd love to hear them. Uh, jump right in, especially if you're online, you don't have to wait to be called on small enough groups. So. Hi, this is Marla with Rural Development. Um, I think the biggest announcement we're going to have is that our value added producer grant, which can be for um, anyone who is taking a product and changing what that product is or how they're marketing it. Um, that grant now will be always announced in November. So that's huge because that one has not always been a consistent grant. So that's just that's about the only thing I can think of right off the top of my head that might be of um, of newsworthy at this point in time. Uh, thanks, Marla. And is that announcement like the RFP comes out, or is that like award time in November? No, then the no the no so would come out then. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much. That's exciting. I know that's no always no fa no fa. Mm -hmm. I said that wrong. No fa. Thank you for sharing. Marla, do you have grants for like specifically some money specifically set aside for urban and small farms? As I'm just thinking like greenhouses or loans for greenhouses and that kind of thing or. We do not. One of the things I've been trying to do is figure out how much um, on like these geothermal greenhouses. I'm trying to get a number that I can come up with for what kind of energy if they had to pay for the energy to blow the air around and not utilizing the heat from the ground to do the heat the building heat that heat and cool that facility if i can come up with a number we could actually do those through our rural energy for america program so we if anybody have. has any ideas on how to work that through i've been i've worked with john hay but i I haven't quite gotten I, I haven't gotten the guy who is who who is making those greenhouses to him to really understand what I'm asking for. So I'm still playing that game and I haven't had a chance to follow up with him on that. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? John, what do you got going on this summer? Any big events? No big events, sort of laying low. So we're, you know, answering phone calls and, you know, all those tomato issues and other issues that are coming in. So we're, we don't do a lot of events during the summer. Yeah, sounds good. Greg, could you talk a little bit more about the the food hub? That's haven't been up in Omaha in a while. I'd love to hear more about what you guys are up to. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, so as part of our work during COVID, we started doing emergency food logistics, um, providing food to uh, underserved communities, um, rural communities. You know, doing that whole piece. As part of that initiative, we found out that there was quite a large gap in terms of infrastructure. Uh, for small organizations that needed to do cold storage, um, needed to be able to accept semis and things of that nature. So 
we kept moving around from different site to different site and then finally we found got access to a warehouse that is about 26,000 square feet so we got a hold of that warehouse with one of our partners uh, one of our funders and uh, we've converted that into a food hub that's right off of about highway 75 in Q uh, just near the UPS right over there so that allows us to bring in semis uh, to store food we've got cold storage freezer space over there now and then we also do community food distributions out of there for organizations to allow them to have organizational food choice and then we're expanding that into uh, community engagement. We just moved in in December, so we thought we'd have more time, but we got busy right away. So we have the food hub side working, and now we're working with some of our different partners looking at um, redesigning the office space side into classrooms, uh, community engagement, things of that nature. So uh, it's been great for the community. It's been great for our partners, you know, in the short term that we've had it open. Um, and it's also allowed us to affect a ton of uh, engagement across the board with the uh, communities that were being missed because we deal with a lot of communities that were operating in the gap. So, I mean, it's really nice, about 26,000 square feet. We're just now starting uh, to refurbish it. So, uh, but food's moving. We're, we move food every single day. We also run our food delivery programs out of there. So we do emergency food, not only organizational, but we do individual home deliveries, uh, senior citizens, elderly, things like that. And we coordinate that out of the food hub as well. So I think it's going to be good. Love, you to have come, love to have you come down, or collaborate and talk about ideas and thoughts. So if anybody's interested, always interested in uh, with sharing and brainstorming. So. Thanks, that's awesome. Yeah, we're excited about it. Anyone else online or in person? Um, this is Lasagna and um, I can just share that I've been working on um, working with Black Soldier Flies um, for addressing food waste and livestock, additional livestock feed. And I have successfully been able to run a full cycle of working with that and seeing how that works with um, food waste and, and just seeing how, um, how, that, how that works um, in a natural way. And so that's been pretty um, very interesting um, learning about that and, and seeing that as a as an alternative and an option and, and addressing food waste and um, healthy livestock feed. So yeah. Congrats. Nice. Anybody else? can mention quick from the farm to school side of things. This is Sarah from NDE. That July 1st, we will award a first allocation for federal funds to schools in eastern Nebraska. Um, they'll receive sub awards for local food for schools is the name of the program. So there's almost a million dollars this allocation. Overall, we'll have $1.5 million and schools will receive their award documentation July 1st for purchases through next school year. So they can purchase locally uh, minimally processed or unprocessed products. So it is an opportunity for folks to connect with schools for those products that they offer them and um, yeah, start to make that market connection. So. Will you have more demand for that money than you have money, you think? Um. Well, I would hope so. Uh, we opened it up to the schools in the 37 eastern counties of Nebraska, so in the four eastern economic development districts, and we had maybe half of the schools eligible that actually accepted the funds. And so now the hope is that with those subawards, it works as a reimbursement, so they have access to a certain amount of funds dependent on student enrollment. So we won't know until the end of the year, the end of the school year. Um, I mean, they'll be making quarterly reimbursement requests. So quarterly, we'll be able to gauge how they're doing with utilizing those funds. But I anticipate that because there's not a, a, a system in place that's really built for them to secure local foods, that all of the funds won't be spent and some of it will be returned. If that's the case, then we'll reallocate in year two and take lessons learned from this year and do the best we can with the second allocation. But we're considering it like a pilot 
so that we can take those lessons learned and assess the program and then report back out to USDA and decision makers and policy makers, the impact and barriers and all of that. So, yeah. Is, is there enough locally sourced food to purchase for the, some of those schools? Is that an issue at all? Because we, I get that a lot, like what comes first, the chicken or the egg, you know, like you create the market, do you create the food and the infrastructure? I mean, is that an issue to source that locally for those schools, do you think? Or it yeah, is probably. an issue, I think, because it's not something that's established mm -hmm. yet. And then um, the other challenge is they receive the funds, but farmers are, you know, they're already planning their production for the season, their seeds and everything else. So as far as communication, um, hopefully for the next funding cycle, there will be some advanced planning with growers to make sure that there's communication about need for the demand and what the supply can be but i think there also has to be you know, growth and relationships and development of trust from those producing the food and those buying it but i think it's it's still a in progress system that will only get better yeah Great. sarah Sarah, I have a question for you. Will it eventually include Western Nebraska? Of course, you know, I live out in Western Nebraska, so I'm concerned. And not the town Western Nebraska. I mean, <laughs> the Western part of the state. You know, um, so it this funding, I guess it possibly could, depending on if there the um, amount of funds that we have for the second allocation and what's what was reimbursed in the first allocation. Every school in the state does have funding right now called supply chain assistance funds. Um, so there is not a requirement that that be local products, like local food for schools is required that it meets the definition of local for this project. Um, but supply chain assistance funds don't have that requirement and every school has supply chain assistance funds. Um, so they do have access to funds, whether or not they'll have local food for schools funds with this chain of uh, COVID relief funds. That's not the plan, Marla. Um, but should the state or federal officials decide to incentivize local purchasing in the future, then ideally like this pilot project can inform uh, the benefits of that. And then the funding could potentially be available for any state that participates in, or any school that participates in child nutrition programs in the future. Okay, thank you. Because I know South Dakota does a lot of local foods and Wyoming is really starting to do a lot of local foods with schools. And so I'm just hoping that eventually that might move this way too. Yeah, I hope we can come out in the fall to Scott's Bluff and maybe partner with Wyoming and offering a producer training for schools and maybe connect with some ag education teachers. We are also funded to develop a statewide farm to school network. And so we're just wrapping up some contracts with partners for that right now. So um, within the next two years, we should have established a farm to school network that would definitely be statewide where we can assess needs and activities um, and do some strategic planning around where we'll focus on working groups and seeing some expansion in front of the school efforts, whether it be procurement or school gardens or ag education or education overall. So and I'm gonna invite Sweet. myself. Thank you. I'll invite myself along so I can help provide fun. funding for the infrastructure. Done. You know. Done. Yeah. There's a few people on the call that well, I hope can join. Yeah, Do <laughs> we really stack something like that? Um Utilize both programs, like one organization that uses both programs, stacks on top to get infrastructure and then the funding for the purchases. Is that doable? Yeah. Well, at NRCS, we 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 only we can't stack monies on top of each other for the same same thing. So the same practice. So like uh -huh. we were gonna co provide cost share assistance for the uh, high tunnel greenhouse and irrigation and composting facility. We couldn't split that with a, in our, a natural resource district, for example, to mm -hmm. exceed the cost of the practice. We could go up to the cost, I think, but not exceed it. Um, so, yeah, for us, it doesn't matter. Hmm. I like that. 
Yeah. That sounds like that's a uh, boy. That's a good presentation in the making right there. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Let so, me think about that one. Sarah, one thing I was going to mention too is I've been working with local foods for Western Nebraska, Wyoming, and South Dakota. So I would have some contacts for you um, already for the um, if you're meeting out here in the fall. Perfect. That's great. Thanks, Marla. I do I have a question. Um, Go for it. So for the conversation, and you know, I haven't been joining, so if I'm taking up too much time, let me know. But uh, so the conversation earlier about the geothermal greenhouses, uh, there was someone who was saying that they were going, trying to get help with determining the utilization, I think the energy utilization from a person. Which person is supposed to be providing that? Is that, was that Russ? Finch that's providing those or someone else that's doing geothermal that's trying to get the utilization rates? It would be Alan Bright. He's the one that has taken over for our Russ Finch. Alan Bright. Okay. It's been a while for me. Alan Bright. Okay. Correct. Correct. Thank he you. is the person who has taken over that business. Ah, oh, okay. Good to know. I've been thank on you. three. Oops, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Greg. No, no, no. I was just saying thank you. Oh, I've been on three sites in Douglas County in the last two months here where uh, the homeowner or the potential new customer with us built their own geothermal high tunnel, like under a greenhouse. Uh -huh. They just put in on their own. And I cannot believe the amount of reward they get from that. One of them is actually, they had to, it's completely energy efficient. They've got a solar array and some batteries just to circulate the air. And they, they, they've had it in place for like two years, but it's under the building. They just put in um, six inch corrugated uh, polyethylene pipe and connected them all and just circulate the air. And so I've been on these sites and just, I can't believe the things I find. So that's that pretty cool. That, yeah, that is a practice NRCS has had conversations about having, adding um, geothermal, but we were just trying to wrap our heads around how the components to that would work and the cost share we would pay and stuff like that. So, so are you guys, do you guys, are are they connecting with that North Platte NRD one then? NRD the, has, the NRD has their own. Right. And that's what I mean. Are you getting data from that or? Well, you said you were trying to connect with. But see, they, they don't have any way to measure that. And so what I'm trying to figure out is, what if they had to pay for that energy, how many KWH, how many therms, whatever it might be, would they have to pay? And I'm assuming oh. there has to be a way that you can do it by how many square feet, because every one of those greenhouses, you can make them different lengths. Right. So you've got to figure out what that cost is or what that offset cost would be because they're using the geothermal Okay. Technology. And I'm like I said, I I haven't evidently communicated it very well to them. And they're more worried about these other numbers. And it's like, that's not what I want. I want to know what you what you would have what it would have cost you to um if you had to if you had to pay heater, for that energy. Yeah, heat or cool conventional. Correct. Method. Correct. Okay. I, I guess I didn't know what you were asking either. So or what you were looking for. So that's why I wondered if you were I've tried, in I've, conversations with them too. I've tried multiple times, but I'm not getting through. And I keep thinking I need to just go meet with them face to face and have the conversation. And, you know, I'm a visual person, so I need to draw it out on paper. Yeah. Because, I mean, I've been to the North Platte NRD one, you know, and they have the you know, they have the extra solar panels and stuff connected to some of that, too, to run, like, their fans and all that kind of stuff. So, correct. okay. All right. Man, do I miss these conversations. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sonia, you had a question about uh, would DRIP also include PVC DRIP system? Can you, is she still with us? Sonia, can you explain that yeah. a little bit more? So, 
Okay. Um, it's just basically using PVC. So um, setting it up with PVC, it's still set up as a drip, but it's not tape. Instead, it's um, actual PVC pipe that is used to set up the irrigation system. Yeah, so like in our practices, um, we would use polyethylene only, but PVC we could add if that was something that you used and saw value to it and it conserved resource of some type, which in that case would be the water. Um, yeah, it's just something we could look at and see if we could adopt it as a practice the way you wanted to use it. So we don't currently have anything like that. We follow a lot of what the industry has on polyethylene. I think it's 10 mil or greater for the wall thickness. Um, but certainly if you have something, let me know and we can take a look at seeing what we could do to add that. Okay, and then the compost system that you were kind of talking about, um, what, is there any more information out there as to what, what that exactly looks like if you're trying to build a compost system? Yeah, so UNL got some really great resources for composting. So uh, I think Sarah Browning is, is a extension agent here in uh, Lancaster County. Um, and they've got all their other uh, extension specialists that are really good at the composting practice. We at NRCS don't use that very often. We don't utilize that in the small scale at all. And so we rely on like the UNL experts to help us with that. But they've got drawings and some examples for systems that we would be able to provide cost share with and uh, I can just visit with you about that if you want to shoot me an email of your schedule and I can give you a call and uh, I can just share some information out about the specifics of what the composting facility would entail. Okay yeah that would be really good because just trying to figure out you know more naturally how how you can incorporate you know, vermicomposting and, you know, other things like that and even utilizing, you know, recyclable resources to build the system and looking at more, um, I know you talk small scale, but even backyard, backyard um, composting, backyard farming. Um, so, you know, even probably a, even a little closer to the individual itself um so yeah i'm really curious about that more of the you know even tighter the the backyard scale of how you're able to um build up your own systems to to provide for your family lasagna i'm just gonna reference you to um backyard farmer so that would be more apt you would be able to find a lot of that information there for the homeowner or their consumer side. <clears throat> so it'd be byf.unl.edu. Right. Um, could you give that to me again? I'm sorry. BYF, backyard farmer, byf.unl.edu. And then um, all of our, it's a, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's a television show. Um, and then all of our shows are on YouTube. So if you just go to YouTube and in the search box, um, click on or type in Backyard Farmer. Mm -hmm. um, you could subscribe to our channel, um, but in in our channel, all you have to do is search. And I mean, we have the compost bins here that are on campus, um, like how to make them, how to build them, but we have you know, raised beds and container gardening and pretty much anything you would need for the consumer homeowner side. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, thank you. Sure. Awesome sharing. Yeah, um, from the Lincoln side, I could just share that um, the, the Community Committee on Local Food that Tim and I are co-chairing, we are very close to having the, the City of Lincoln's master food plan, first master food plan, uh, go to City Council. So we're hoping that'll be approved by the next time this committee meets in September. Uh, you never know exact timelines with political schedules, but it has to go before City Council and County Commission. But 
Uh, very excited about that. And if you haven't seen a draft of that plan, we'll we'll be sharing it out more soon in the next couple of months to kind of rally support. So that'll get adopted into the comprehensive plan for Lincoln Lancaster County and just sort of elevate food issues and hopefully bring more resources and focus. And it's been really exciting recently, just a lot of meetings and conversations trying to connect the dots on food system stuff. So uh, I think it's just the beginning and we'll kind of see, see where it takes us. So, um, yeah. Also, I do have um, one thing I wanted to share probably with you, um, Brock, uh, is that um, right now a lot of the North Omaha community uh, partners, there's some particular partners that are working on trying to um, upgrade parks and things for the young people in the underserved community. So, you know, maybe looking at some of those um, organizations as a way to reach out to share opportunities to transform uh, some of their park systems that are kind of just out there into maybe more usable, um, pur purposeful urban type settings where young people especially can learn, give them opportunities to do things um, that's a little bit more in their communities. So that may be something to look at to some of the, the organizations that are really, really working hard um, uh, within their um, local communities and trying to improve um, food and opportunities for these young people to have something to do and learn. And so I know right now there's something that is happening on uh, July 2nd at Miami Park. Um, there's, and so that may be um, a really good opportunity to try and get out um, with some of these other organizations that are really local community really close to trying to, you know, it's like gang community, it's a lot of the families and and trying to upgrade parks. And so this is a, a first time, this is like one of the first parks that they're really trying to work with and make some changes. So that might be a really good avenue to kind of meet some of them, um, of those partnerships. I know there is a, um, individual that will be there that they just bought um, a huge uh, forestry kind of sort of area within the community that they're really, really working with transforming and things like that. So that might be um, that might be a good avenue also to to look at um, just the yeah. community and underserved areas. If you've got information on that and you could just forward that out to me, that would be super. Yeah, I'll helpful. send you out the flyer that they okay. actually have with the time and and they're looking for help. So, you know, one way to get in is to be involved with some of them. Um, so, yes. And I did meet with uh, Matt Clevenich. He's the director of Omaha Parks and Rec. I met with him two weeks ago and his staff and just made him aware of our programs and some of the, the opportunities that we might have to collaborate together. So Omaha Parks and Rec is aware of our programs, and I think that's a good connection I made there too. So we'll maybe attack that from both directions. So yeah, if you share that out, that would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, if there are no further thoughts, I think we can kind of wrap up for the day. Uh, we are looking for next meeting at like kind of end of September. So sometime between the 20th and the 28th. So we'll try to get that sent out nice and early. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of continue on, I think, continuing to share from the NRCS side and the federal agency side, as well as uh, inviting different folks like Sam did today to kind of share about their programs and uh, kind of inform us the cool work that's already happening on the ground. So if you are very excited about something you want to share or there's something you've heard about here that you want to learn more about, let us know and that'll help us plan for the next meeting. So, but yeah, thanks so much for being here today and hope everyone enjoys their rest of their week. So thanks. thank you. Thanks all. Good talking to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.